This past weekend, Black Panther came out and it's been getting tons of praise for its villain, Killmonger. So I wanted to do something a little bit different today and rank all 21 of the main villains from the MCU, from the worst, to the best. Now, as we go into this, to be clear, I'm talking about the MCU from Marvel Studios. So it's not going to include the X-Men villains. It's not going to include the Spider-Man villains, except for the Vulture. That's what we're talking about, the MCU villains. I'm also not rating the movies. This is the villains themselves, and it's the main villains. I'm not including, like, Ben Kingsley's The Mandarin. I'm not including Zola, those types of characters. I don't even have Thanos in my list yet, because he hasn't been a main villain in a movie. He's just been kind of cameo parts. So, before I get started, go ahead and put your ranking down below. Tell me which ones you love, which ones you hate, and you can include Thanos, Zola, if you want, into your list. I just don't have them in my list. With that said, let's get started. Coming in in last place is Malkith from Thor The Dark World. What can I say? This character is utterly forgettable for me. I watched this movie less than a week ago, and I can barely tell you a single thing about this character. I know he's an elf, he likes it dark, and he's trying to do that using the ether. But I don't remember a single line of dialogue that he said. I don't remember really him getting involved in the action. His plan is just utterly forgettable. The movie gives us so little information about him. It gives him so little personality. He makes no impact on you at all. There's characters in this list that I find more frustrating, annoying, cliche, but at least they made an impact. At least I can remember something about him. Malkith is just forgettable. Coming in at number 20 is The Sovereign from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. These characters just annoyed me from the second they came on screen because they seemed like they were written exclusively for the point of moving the plot forward. We have no depth on them. We don't really understand where they're coming from. We're just told a piece of information about how they function just so that Rocket can break that rule and make them angry. Beyond that, I really didn't care for the fact that the sound effects and the way they're designed designed is to sound like 80s video games. Uh, I just thought that was so cheesy and kind of childish and I thought their storyline was pretty dreadful in this movie and it kind of killed the movie Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 for me. And number 19 is Cassilius from Doctor Strange. Much Mike Malkith, this is another character that's just very forgettable. He exists just to be the foil for a villain. We get a num just a little bit of background information about him and his connection to the wizard and why he wants to try and gain certain things to gain extra power. But as for a character, he's just the evil version of our hero. There's not a lot of characterization. There's not a lot of depth. We don't learn about his motives. We can't really resonate with what's going on with him. He's just the bad guy wizard person trying to do evil bad guy wizard things, which creates some cool wizard battles. But as for a character himself, you could just interchange him with any other wizard type character and he'd be just the same as the one that we got in this movie. So once again, another very forgettable villain. And number 18 is Yellow Jacket from Ant-Man. In and of itself, this character doesn't bother me. I like the actor, Corey Stoll. The character creates some nice little battles in the end. Actually, that last third act with the Thomas the Train stuff, I think he's actually a really cool, fun little sequence inside the MCU. The problem here is that the character is just a new version of Obadiah Stane from the original Iron Man. He's the businessman that's over the company of one of our main characters, and he wants to sell things for his own profiteering thing. He's kind of jealous that he wasn't given information, and therefore he turns into a supervillain in the third act of the movie. We've seen it before, and therefore, he's a very redundant, familiar, cliche villain. Number 17 is Whiplash from Iron Man 2. I think all the pieces are here with Whiplash to be a great villain. The idea of he's got a long history with the Starks, he's been wounded, harmed, you understand why he'd be angry, you understand why he has the brilliance to compete technologically with Tony Stark and Iron Man. And then after the first act, the movie puts him in a lab for like an hour of the movie and he shows up just in the last 15 minutes to recreate the third act of the first Iron Man movie. Everything was there for him to be great, for Mickey Rourke to be one of the great Marvel villains, and then they wasted the character with what they did with him and made him very ineffective. Coming in at number 16 is gonna be Aldrich Killian from Iron Man 3. Now, I don't hate this villain, but if you step back and think about it, he's just kind of a repeat of the Riddler from Batman Forever and Jamie Foxx's Electro from Amazing Spider-Man 2. He's the guy that at the beginning of the movie, he's this nerdy, weird looking guy that tries to reach out to our main hero. The hero ignores him and so he gets hurt. Uh, eventually something happens that gives him superpowers, he becomes cool looking and he's out for revenge. So... 
It's been done before. It's a little bit cliche. It feels out of place inside the Mo uh, Iron Man trilogy. The extremist stuff feels out of place to me inside the Iron Man trilogy. It, feels, it works in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it feels a little bit weird here in the Iron Man movies specifically. So overall, maybe there was some way this could have been better, but I did not like the way it eventually played out in this movie. Coming in at number 15 is Ego, the living planet from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Now there's a lot of things about Ego that I really enjoy because it's got Kurt Russell in there. Kurt Russell is great. He's so charismatic and fun and he can sell this horrible sociopathic villain in a way that makes him still kind of charming. Of course, because he ties into the story with Star-Lord, there's some character dynamics there that are really cool and interesting throughout the movie, but his story gets so dark so fast and because of the way it kind of plays out it undermines some of the positives from the first two-thirds of the movie he could have been more interesting he could have been more compelling if he didn't go so far so evil killing so many of his kids killing off star lord's mother where you just had no way can relate to his plan because he's just so evil that it was just kind of distasteful to me and not compelling or interesting at all by the time we know everything going on with him. At number 14 is Zemo from Captain America Civil War. Now this is a character that I think fits kind of nicely into the movie, but also feels kind of superfluous in the movie. He doesn't do things that make me angry. Daniel Brohl is a very fine actor. He sets some things in motion. You can see where kind of he makes the plot line kind of, he sets up those little, little dominoes and then he pushes it over that creates the tension and drama in this movie. The problem is, is that you feel like they could have done a weekend rewrite and taken him out of the movie entirely. And you almost feel like the movie might have been better if they had done that. So it's not that he's so bad in this movie or that he feels cliche, redundant like some of the other ones on this list. You just feel like, did we even need him in this movie? So at the end of the day, he's only at number 14. Coming in at number 13 is Ronan the Accuser from Guardians of the Galaxy. This is another just kind of mediocre villain in the MCU. There's nothing about him that I was like, ah, oh, this is annoying, ah, oh, this is so bad. He's, But he's also just kind of an evil guy trying to get power, trying to raise himself up and, you know, make his own name for himself inside of the universe and therefore our guardians have to stop him. So you kind of hate him for the evil things that he's done. He's powerful, he can even take out Drax but there's not a lot of depth to him. There's not a lot of characterization. He's just an evil guy that wants more power. Like many of our MCU villains, forgettable and a little bit dull. Coming in at number 12 is going to be Abomination from The Incredible Hulk. I think in this movie in and of itself, Abomination isn't a terrible villain at all. Tim Roth's kind of arc in it. He, we get a lot of time with him, so we understand why he becomes Abomination. He's a soldier that is just kind of a well, warmonger of himself that he just wants to kill people. The problem here is it's a little bit of cliche inside of superhero movies to create a villain that's just the opposite, the evil mirror of our hero. So Bruce Banner is given incredible power and his thought is I want to get rid of this because this is too dangerous. No one should have this power. And so the humble hero is contrasted with the prideful soldier and then they become the equal versions that are both big gigantic monster creatures battling each other. So inside the movie, I think he works well enough. I don't have any hate for the character. Coming in at number 11 is going to be Justin Hammer from Iron Man 2. I actually really like the Justin Hammer character. I wish they would have actually brought him back at some point in time. Maybe they will bring him back uh, eventually inside the MCU. I think there's a lot of potential for him to be an interesting side character that's a kind of an evil or petty version of Tony Stark. He's so jealous that it leads him to do villainous things. He is kind of a good villain in that he doesn't view himself as a villain. He doesn't, he doesn't have like a mustache twirling plan to blow up buildings and get a bunch of money. Money. He's just jealous of Tony Stark. He wants the contracts he's getting. He wants to be as smart as him, but he's not. And it drives him to do villainous things. It drives him to do stupid things that have consequences. In the case of this movie, he gets whiplash. Now, he's not a great villain in that, you know, he's not the guy that's fighting our main characters. His role in this movie because it doesn't give him a whole lot to kind of do inside the movie because there's so many kind of plot lines going in. So it feels like he's sidelined. But I think the character himself is a very interesting character to put inside that Iron Man trilogy. Coming in at number 10 is the Red Skull from Captain America, the first Avenger. I was hoping that I could put Red Skull higher up on my list. The problem here is that having rewatched 
Captain America, the first Avenger, just a couple weeks ago, I all... I, the first half of the movie, I found the Red Skull's character kind of dull because he was just kind of an exposition jump talking about uh, all sorts of power and we'll take over the world and the Fuhrer is just looking for these things and we want it to... Do, and all sorts of stuff like that. And so he's not really kind of getting compelling until the second half of the movie when he starts to be the foil for Captain America and they start having a little bit of their back and forth. Now what I love about this movie and what they do with the Red Skull is they have this amazing production design to it so he's got like this jumbo long car and all these little details that just make it feel like a fun comic book villain but not a truly great villain because at the end of the day he is just kind of a bad guy driven by power driven mad by the stuff done to himself wanting more power to rule the world coming in at number nine is going to be the other and the chitauri from the avengers now on some levels they're a little bit thin in that their function in the movie is essentially just to be the third act cannon fodder for the Avengers. But this movie's crafted in such a way that it gets away with it, that it's actually fun to see them because the little details of the way their characters are designed, the big gigantic worm creatures, that they're this army that kind of gets a little bit Loki tricked into being his army to invade a planet while also kind of working with Thanos. Just that third act in Avengers is probably my favorite third act in any comic book movie ever because it's just a dream come true for comic book fans and just so energetic, so fun. And they are the cannon fodder that made that possible. Coming in at number eight is Obadiah Stane from the original Iron Man, also known as Iron Monger. Rewatching Iron Man, this character feels a little bit kind of like one of those forgotten characters of the MCU that I think is a lot better and more compelling than people give him credit for. He makes for a great Foil really is the evil businessman to Tony Stark in that as Tony's on this journey to discover, wait, I'm responsible for giving weapons of war to the world. I need to change my legacy. And the reason that a lot of this is happening is because of Obadiah Stane. And I think that just makes for a very compelling story. I said this in my Iron Man review a couple or about a month ago. that I feel like if they'd done the Iron Mar Monger stuff in Iron Man 2. Iron Man 2 would have been better, as well as Iron Man 1 would have been better, because we would have gotten more time with him. And if they'd done that, if they'd made Obadiah Stane kind of one of these villains running throughout multiple different Iron Man movies, and he's more kind of the thinking Lex Luthor type in the first one, and the guy in the suit, which I guess is also a Lex Luthor type thing to do, in the second one, he probably would have been top five, but he doesn't quite make it there. But I think he is an underrated MCU villain. Coming in at number seven is going to be Ultron from Avengers Age of Ultron. Now, as we went into this movie, a lot of us were kind of disappointed coming out of Age of Ultron because from the trailers, they set up Ultron is going to be this menacing, scary villain that's trying to tear the world apart. He doesn't want to have strings and they're playing the creepy Pinocchio music. And they had some great trailers from that movie. We were expecting the Empire Strikes Back of the MCU. And then the movie itself was a lot more lighthearted. The Ultron character is a little bit too sarcastic. And it, I think it deflated our interest in Ultron a little bit just because of where our expectations were at and where the movie ended up landing. Stepping back from all of that, I like Ultron as a villain. I think he plays nicely into the MCU. The character makes sense as an extension of what Tony Stark was doing. If we remove our expectations and disappointment with where they went with it, very solid villain. Coming in at number six is Hela from Thor Ragnarok. Now going into this movie, I was kind of expecting we were gonna get just kind of another evil MCU type villain that comes in that's evil for the sake of being evil. And then the movie throws some twists in there that I did not see coming. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, spoiler for a big twist in the movie, it's Thor's sister. And there's this whole hidden background about Odin's past and her role in all of that. And all of it makes for so much more interesting of a movie than I was thinking. You throw Kate Blanchett in it, give her a role, especially in Thor Ragnarok, where she can just chew up scenery, be campy, be obnoxious. And all of it just makes for a fun character. Coming in at number five is going to be Alexander Pierce from Captain America, The Winter Soldier. So this movie is the one that kind of turned the whole MCU upside down, our understanding of what was going on, what S.H.I.E.L.D. was, gets turned upside down, and who's kind of behind that? 
Alexander Pierce. And how do they do that? They get Robert Redford. They make this movie heavily inspired by 70s political thrillers. So they get a guy known for being in those types of movies. So even just his presence in the movie evokes a certain emotion of uh, time past of a certain type of movie. And you just can see him as the evil uh, vi villain guy. You can also see him as the dignified politician guy. You can see him as the business. You can see him in all the types of roles that this character was as you go through the movie and you you kind of like him, suspicious of him, and then you turn into, you realize he's the guy that's turned our whole world upside down with his evilness. So this is a character that's not the guy that's out there punching Captain America in the face. He's the mastermind behind the scenes that built this whole network evil world inside of one of the absolute best movies in the MCU that turned the whole thing upside down. So he makes it into our top five. Coming in at number four is going to be the Winter Soldier from Captain America, the Winter Soldier. They find a way with this one to bring back Bucky and take a very good hearted guy and find a way to do the cliche of the evil mirror of our hero in a way that makes sense. That what if Captain America didn't get recruited by the good guys, didn't get frozen, but got recruited by the bad guys and brainwashed and used for evil. What would that look like? That's the kind of, a, and it's set up in the previous movie. They find a way to kind of arc into it and have this extended story. And at the end of the day, he's a villain that we want to see redeemed. So you've got kind of the mystery in there. You've got the twist reveals of his ties to our past characters. So all this evokes a little bit of a Darth Vader type vibe into it. All of this makes for our Winter Soldier one of our more interesting and most interesting villains and compelling characters that's kind of an anti-hero by the end of it inside of the MCU. And number three is Killmonger from Black Panther. What makes him so fascinating is he represents a worldview and perspective. This movie has all sorts of themes that resonate with co current politics, views, discussions going on, and what is the role of certain nations that have resources and power to the rest of the world. That idea is being explored throughout the movie and so his perspective represents something that people can resonate with in that he's angry about things that are real. He's angry about things that have actually happened. Now, not Wakanda, but things that have actually happened in human history. Therefore, you can resonate with him. You can understand where he's coming from. There are people who can resonate with the anger that he is feeling and that ties into the movie that we're watching so well. Now, I was debating, should, does he go top two, or how, how high does he go up on the list? The reason for me that he lands at number three is that his character only has one scene with dialogue in the first half of the movie. We only really get kind of half a movie of awesome Killmonger, worldview perspective, all this type stuff going on. If we'd gotten more, perhaps he would have gotten higher up on the list for me. Our runner up at number two is the Vulture from Spider-Man Homecoming. Now what makes this character so fascinating and makes it into the top two for me is he's so different from the rest of the villains in the MCU. He's not trying to blow up the world. He's not trying to like have yeah, these evil schemes or wants to kill anybody. He's just a guy trying to make ends meet for his family. Therefore, he's kind of like the Walter White from Breaking Bad of the MCU. Scenarios happen where he got burned by the world, wasn't sure how he's gonna make things work, and therefore he turned evil, finds himself down a path, and we have this time jump in there where we can understand why he would get so evil. And he's a guy that just has a normal family. He's got normal life, and that's what's kind of driving his actions. All of this makes for a guy that almost feels relatable, someone you can connect with, because it's Michael Keaton. He's actually very charismatic, very charming, very likable. All in all, one of the more interesting villains inside of the MCU for me, because he's so different, so distinct. That's why, and maybe it's contra- I don't know. Maybe, well, I'll find out in the comics how controversial of a pick it is to have him at number two. But in first place is Loki from Thor, the Avengers, and other films in the MCU. You. Now this is a character we've gotten to see a lot of because he's been in a whole bunch of different movies and what makes him so fascinating is that he's a very conflicted character that has competing values. He seems to actually care about his Asgardian roots. He also is out to get them. He wants to betray them. He wants their respect. Sometimes he wants to kill them. He's all over the place. But you understand why. You understand why he's conflicted. And inside of him, his personality is this sneaky, conniving guy. There's an inherent dishonesty to him. There's an inherent selfishness to him. And there's an inherent need inside of him for the validation of others. This makes for a very bizarre, captivating mix of a character that at times they keep trying to make him a hero. And sometimes he does heroic things. And other times he does extremely villainous things, which makes for some amazing, great jokes in the original Avengers movies. I've care how you speak. 
Loki is beyond reason, but he is of Asgard. And he is my brother. He killed 80 people in two days. He's adopted. Add to that, Tom Hiddleston's just so good and fun, charismatic, and he has such amazing chemistry with Crims Hemsworth as Thor. So all in all, Loki has the most screen time. He's the one that has had all these different ways we've gotten to see him. So for me, he comes in at number one as the greatest villain of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. How about you guys? Tell me yours down below in the comment section. Rank all 21 of the villains for me. I'd love to see where you guys are coming from. And if you want to throw Thanos, the Destroyer, Zola, whoever else you want to throw in there, I would love to hear your take on it. Also, from time to time, people ask me where I get my shirts from. I get them from Tee Public. There's a link down below in the description. It'll take you to kind of my merch store over there. It has my Sean Chandler Talks About shirts, as well as the different shirts from their store that I've purchased and some other ones I plan to purchase in the near future. So you can check that out. If you're watching this when I first posted, Tomorrow, February 25th, they're going to start a sale. Everything in the store will be 30% off. So if you like this shirt, if you got like my Thanos vs. the Universe shirt, it'll be on sale starting tomorrow. And if you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews, TV reviews, ranking videos. But the key thing is I don't want to just talk about movies. I want to talk about movies with you. So join me down in the comment section. Let's have a lively discussion about Marvel villains, which ones we love, which ones we hate, which ones we've completely forgotten about. And as always, thank you for watching.